Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, today's uh, uh, webinar. I'm Galina Hale, a co-director of Center for Analytical Finance at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's last installment of our speaker series on COVID and financial innovation and inclusion. Uh, since it's the last installment, I would like to thank uh, our uh, co-sponsors, UC Investment and uh, UC Chief Investment Officer Jagdeep Basher, who is also with us today, as well as the co my co-director Nirvikar Singh and the support team from the Division of Social Sciences, especially Johnny White, for making the series possible. Uh, we have one more event in this academic year. On April 16, Jim Dowd, the CEO of Northern Capital, is going to talk to us about the use of blockchains in finance. Um, for today, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sydney Ludwigsen. She will talk to us about the stock market during the COVID crisis time. Sydney Ludwigsen is a professor of uh, economics at the New York University as a leading expert on uh, finance and macroeconomics. Her research focuses on the interplay between asset markets and the macroeconomic uh, developments. She's also a director of the Asset Pricing Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, the floor is yours, Sydney. Thanks a lot, Galena. Let me share my screen. Okay, everyone can see that. So today I wanna to talk to you about uh, some work with Josue Cox and Dan Greenwald. And it's really about the early months of the COVID pandemic and what, how do we understand the US stock market's sharp V-shaped trajectory in March and April of 2020. Now, <clears throat> You know, we, as we know now, by February of 2020, um, COVID-19 had already set in motion a worldwide disruption in economic activity, causing the U.S. unemployment rate to reach 14.7% in April. The S&P 500 initially reacted to news of the disease by losing 33.7% of its value between February 19th and March 23rd of 2020. But then the market abruptly regained the vast majority of its lost value, rising 29% between March 24th and April 17th. And this is a surge that left the index back where it stood in August of 2019 when the US economy was booming and the unemployment rate was 3.7%. So we'd like to try to understand what explains this sharp uh, V-shaped trajectory of the US market that took place over a matter of weeks in the early stage of COVID. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Now to address that question, we're gonna need a, a model of how equities are priced. And so what we have done here is employed a theoretical model that is, is in other work of mine with Dan Greenwald and Martin Letow of Berkeley Haas, along with updated empirical estimates of that model in order to decompose the market's changes in the early weeks of the COVID crisis into distinct component sources attributable to fluctuations in either aggregate economic activity, that is in the growth of that activity, in interest rates, in corporate earnings shares of output, and or discount rate fluctuations, not driven by interest rates, but driven by risk premia. And amongst those, you can think of uh, ones that are possibly driven by the pricing, what we'll call the pricing of stock market risk. Okay, so think risk aversion or beliefs or sentiment. All of these components exist in the model and are uncorrelated with each other so that we can precisely decompose uh, the market's movement into one of those component sources. Okay, so let's fix ideas <clears throat> uh, with a simple example. Um, and we're gonna consider a simple model of equity valuation that is likely to be familiar to many people this is not the actual model that we'll use for our analysis, which is much more general, um, but its simplicity serves to illustrate some of the main mechanisms on how the market valuation could be decomposed into these particular sources. And actually much of the same points on how this works go through in the more complex settings. So we can um, fix ideas this way. So COVID-19 is a big negative output shock. Um, 
the question we want to ask is what effect might we expect that to have had on the stock market? And so let's consider what I'll call the constant growth rate Gordon growth model, uh, which is here. So in this model, PT is the stock price. DT is the dividend at time T, or you can think about it more generally as shareholder payout at time T. And that of course is influenced by economic output through corporate earnings. <clears throat> and then there's G, which is the expected future growth rate of dividends. Um, this G is what markets expect to be in the future. This G doesn't have the time subscript on it here because in the simple Gordon growth model, it's assumed constant. But K here is the required return on the stock market. And that is influenced both by a short-term interest rate and by a risk premium on the stock market over that interest rate. Okay, so we can see here that variation in P on the left-hand side can be decomposed into component sources on the right-hand side. And what I, I want to point out here is that note if, if the negative output shock due to COVID were permanent, that is a one-time drop and no expectation of recovery from there, um, of our, some sort of reversion back to a mean, then it would have no influence on the expected future growth, right? So we would see G wouldn't change at all. And if you assume for the moment that corporate earnings shares of that output and shareholder dividends, dividends therefore fall proportionally with output and assume for the moment that there were no change in the required return K, then we would expect stock prices to fall proportionately with output and dividends. That is to say, a percentage decline in P on the left-hand side can be at most as large as the percentage decline in output itself. Okay. Now, if the shock is not permanent, but instead had a large transitory component with it, that would suggest then that analysts, and this is of course what most analysts expect, um, that would imply that the future growth rate expected by market participants would actually be expected to increase as we climb out of this hole. So what you would see there heuristically is that while, D, while DT is falling sharply because output today is falling and earnings are falling, um, G would be rising and that would dampen the effect of the COVID-19 output shock on stock prices as you can see here as those two terms would have offsetting influences. In that case, the percentage decline in the price would be less than the percentage decline in the output shock. All right, now you can also observe here that from this simple model that any decrease in K, either because interest rates decline or the equity risk premium declines would tend to raise P. So if we just bear those in mind, uh, that will so keep that in mind, that'll give you the intuition for many of the things I'm going to discuss next. Now our model, um, this is a very simple model. It has a, a fixed expected growth rate and fixed required return. And then the model that we actually use um, is much more general um, and flexible. You know, we model the dynamics of all of these components. And I won't go into the details in the model here, but it's flexible enough to explain 100% of the change in equity values over our sample and over any specific episode with one of these component sources that we've been discussing. So we'll, we'll estimate this full dynamic model using state-based methods and data, and that will allow us to precisely decompose the market's observed change into just these distinct component sources. Okay, so let's think about this episode. And the first thing I wanna think about is um, um, the, the V has two legs. There's a down leg and an up leg. And so the first part we wanted to think about here is just the down leg. So what could explain the sharp 33.7% decline in the stock market between February 12th and March 23rd. So let's start by trying to understand that. Now, the most obvious candidate that people think about is, well, there was a, a very sharp, previously unexpected drop in output um, that, that hit, right, you know, in um, starting in March and spilled over in, into April, right? So Let's start with that question. How large of an effect on the market could we ex reasonably expect that sharp contraction and output by itself to have, you know, through all these lockdowns and everything? So to do that exercise though, we do need a way to calibrate the size of the COVID-19 shock to output that is the unexpected drop as perceived by something like market participants. Therefore, what we did is consulted a survey, the survey of professional forecasters, this is a quarterly survey, and in the 2020 Q2 wave, which was taken in May, 
of this survey, we can see a very large revision in the forecast, which is actually a nowcast for 2020 Q2, um, with the median nowcast negative 32.2%. And since previously in the Q1 wave, you know, analysts were expecting some very small positive number, we can effectively take this entire 32.2% drop um, as the magnitude of the, the surprise shock. So once we analyze 32.2%, convert it to a quarterly growth rate in logs, that's negative 9.7%. So keep that in mind. On a quarterly basis in logs, because we're doing things with logs here, um, that's negative 9.7%. Okay, so that gives us a magnitude. But as mentioned, when we just looked at the simple Gordon growth model, you know, the effect on asset prices, which are highly forward-looking variables, especially when you have a long-lived asset like the stock market, that really depends on how persistent the output drop is expected to be. So we need some measure of what the expected persistence of this drop was around that time. And for that, we can take our model. Um, <clears throat> First of all, we're going to model this as a, a shock to what we'll call, you know, what's known as a first order autoregressive process. And that will allow us to calibrate a persistence. The question is, you know, how do we figure out the magnitude of the persistence? Well, the 2020 Q2 wave of the SPF also gave us a median forecast for the annualized real GDP growth in 2020 Q3 of 10.2%. And so we can use those two forecasts, specifically the nowcast for 2020 Q2 and the Q2 forecast for 2020 Q3 to solve for the implied perceived first order autoregressive coefficient. And we find a value of 0.74 and that serves as our baseline value. Now to understand this number intuitively, just note that a fully permanent drop would correspond to a value of unity while a shock that is completely reverting in one period would correspond to a value of zero so this 0.74 number, which is larger than a half, but considerably less than one, indicates the survey participants at the time were expecting the COVID shock to have some persistence to it, but to be clearly far from permanent. Okay, probably due to the transitory nature of lockdowns and those kinds of things. Okay, so with those two things in hand, the models now specified, we can use it to, and data, to compute estimates of the part of the decline in the market that can be attributed to various sources. And we're gonna start with this output shock itself. And again, keep in mind that the market lost 33.7% of its value just between February 19th and March 23rd. That translates into a log growth of negative 0.411. And so what this table is showing you, the punchlines, an output shock at a quarterly rate of negative 9.7% for the quarter can account for a log change in the market of just negative 0.0015, right? That explains a mere 30.37% of the actual log growth that we observed, which is negative 0.411 in, in logs, okay? Now that's at our estimated persistence. And as we alluded to earlier, even if we assume the initial shock uh, of the same, same magnitude were, were expected to be far more persistent than what the SPF data implies, we should get bigger effects, right? But uh, that mechanism would still be unable to explain much of the observed decline in the market. Um, and in, in the limit, a fully permanent shock, which is what this number corresponding to one over here shows, could only deliver a quarterly log change in the market of negative 0.0972, which is just the actual decline in output itself, as we discussed earlier that's about 24% of the observed decline in the market. And so again, you know, we can understand why we're getting these small contributions by thinking back to the logic provided by the Gordon growth model, even under permanent output shocks where shareholder payout would fall proportionally with output. Once we fix the required return on stocks, the log decline in the value of market equity can be at most as large as the output growth shock itself. And since the observed decline in the stock market between February 19 and March 23rd was 33.7%, that's not annualized, that's just the raw decline, while the expected quarterly decline for output in 2020 Q2 was only 9.7%, the direct contribution of changes in output alone to the observed market decline is just quite limited. So something else must have contributed or added to the bar output decline in order to explain the market's decline. And so the next thing we wanna consider is corporate earnings. 
And it's possible, for example, the corporate earnings fell even more than proportionally with output, and that would help us explain a larger drop in the stock market. So <clears throat> that's what we consider next. And we, um, you know, what, what can we explain with the same baseline transitory that is using our, our estimate from the survey of professional forecasters, uh, transitory decline with an autoregressive coefficient of 0.74 output shock. Um, and if we accompany that by a decline in the corporate earnings share of various magnitudes, and this table is showing you various magnitudes across the top in terms of standard deviations, and we're combining these two then, right? So you get this big output shock, and then at the same time, corporate earnings are taking an even bigger hit by some uh, magnitude. So corporate earnings would be falling more than proportionally with output. Now, here again, the perceived persistence of any decline in corporate earnings as a share of output, as we're modeling it here, should matter greatly for these forward-looking uh, stock prices. So we estimate in the more general model, a so-called mixed frequency model that accounts for lower and higher frequency, lower frequency being more trend-like components in these series and higher frequency, more transitory components or like cyclical movements. And we separate these out uh, in order to try to understand um, you know, the, the role for the stock market, because it's really the lower frequency stuff that will move forward looking asset prices. <clears throat> Even though a lot of the variation in things like earnings share may be high frequency. So it's important to get those two separated out. Now, um, so that's when you see uh, LF and HF, that's what that is. It's low frequency and high frequency. We estimate these are two separate latent components that we can estimate using data. Now, we can explain the entire market drop if we were to have a roughly 23% decline in the low frequency component of the earnings share. Or we could explain it if we combine the output drop with a 145% decline in the high frequency component of the earnings share. But it's not clear at all that either of these are plausible. For example, and I'll show you a plot in a moment, um, while the earnings share fell about 23% in the fourth quarter of 2008 during the great financial crisis, that was a highly transitory decline, suggesting that it was entirely attributable to the high frequency component. Um, and you can see that, you know, a 20, uh, you know, that, that um, this would require getting, getting uh, this kind of decline um, that we've seen using the high frequency component would require a 1.5 unit log drop in the earnings share. That's more than six times larger than any decline observed in post-war US data. So let's take a look at the earnings share over time. And here you see the US corporate earnings share. Um, and you can see that there is a big fall in the earnings share in the great financial crisis, right? So these are recession shadings. Here's the last recession. Here's the current recession so far. And you also see relatively quick mean reversion. So this is gonna show up as all coming from the high frequency component. There was a full recovery within the next five years. Now let's look at this crisis, right? Between 2019 Q4 and 2020 Q1, we see a much smaller 10% drop in the earnings share than there was in the great financial crisis. And this is, it looks even more transitory than the one in the last crisis. So by 2020 Q3, the profit share is way back up you know, up above even where it was in 2019. And so the bottom line here is that explaining the full drop with these combined sources of variation would require not only a very large drop in the earnings share, something not seen in this entire recession, it doesn't appear to have happened, but also one that persists for decades and that's just unheard of in post-war data. In fact, if you take these numbers, in fact, you know, it's about a 10% decline that we got in the first quarter um, you know, you're looking at it most, these combined sources can explain, you know, around here, right? About 7.6% of the 33.7% drop in the market. Okay, so these two are just not going to get us very far. <clears throat> that suggests that these economic fundamentals in the form of a large output drop, even if accompanied by a substantial decline in the corporate earnings share of output, which didn't happen, um, they're just unlikely forces for explaining the declines in the market. And so something else uh, must have been contributing. Okay. So let's now go uh, 
back to the V shape itself, of course, there was not just a down, there was also an abrupt turnabout. And it's even more challenging, it seems, to explain the market turnabout that began on March 24th without appealing to large fluctuations in discount rates driven primarily by how risk was priced. Okay, let's think about March 24th compared to March 23rd. You know, there really wasn't much in expected fundamentals that appeared to improve in late March. If anything, market expectations of near term future cash flows to the stock market further deteriorated around that time. And we know this from the work of Gormson and Coyan, who use data on dividends futures. And as far as risk premia go, keep in mind that risk premia are the product of a quantity of risk and times the price of risk. Proxies for the quantity of risk don't appear to have greatly improved in that at that time in late March. Um, measures of, of aggregate uncertainty, for example, sharply increased in March and remained unusually elevated by historical standards throughout April, though they did decline somewhat. So this then leaves only interest rates or the price of risk as the factor that could fill the gap on the other, on the other direction. Let's look at interest rates. <clears throat> um, you know, interest rates really aren't plausible candidates for thinking about the drop in stock prices, uh, but they did move in a direction that could in principle help us explain the rebound. So, you know, we know that the Fed action, the Fed actions brought the Fed funds rate down to a range of zero to 0.25% by March 15th. And since our model incorporates interest rates as a driver, in particular short-term interest rates, as a driver of the value of market equity, we can quantify the direct effect of this drop in rates. Now, short-term interest rates, again, they also have a lower and higher frequency component. But as I've been saying, you know, only the low frequency components really have the ability to explain big movements in the market. So let me just give you the punchline here. If we were to make the conservative assumption that all of the decline in interest rates in March that we observed were, were attributable to the low frequency component of short-term interest rates, the more trend-like movements, this would imply a log increase in the market of 0.0439, and that would undo about 10.6% of the original market crash, but still fall far short of explaining the full recovery in equity values through mid-April. So, you know, without some movement in investor beliefs or sentiment or risk pricing, which in our, you know, at risk tolerance, which in our model will show up in this price of risk, um, you know, you, you, you would need, uh, you, you just simply can't explain this dramatic V-shaped trajectory. So, the question then really becomes if um, risk pricing uh, through you know, sentiment or willingness to tolerate risk uh, is really, um, was really important and that seems to be the only, you know, it has to have played some relatively large role. Why did attitudes or belief shift so sharply? And so the next part of our investigation was to um, think about the role of the Federal Reserve. And you know, we certainly don't suggest or, or find evidence that this could have been the, necessarily the only thing going on, but uh, we, we did want to look at that and it is possible to look at some data on that. And so that's what we did. So um, the next thing we did, you know, we, um, after ruling out sort of fundamentals don't seem to be doing it, um, you know, we want to ask, there's some catch-all category that we're, we're calling risk pricing that's driven by sentiment or the risk tolerance of key participants and news about fundamentals in the future, perhaps, that aren't captured in today's fundamentals. Um, those are all in this catch-all category of risk pricing. And so we want to study the role of uh, the Fed in, in, you know, all of these could be strongly influenced by Federal Reserve uh, policy or announcements of policy, and we want to study the role of these announcements. Okay, so we do this using a high frequency event study of the stock market's behavior in the minutes surrounding the Fed, Fed communications in March and April of 2020. And we were particularly interested in how announcements pertaining to new credit facilities designed specifically for the COVID crisis um, and, you know, were unprecedented both in scope and magnitude, how those might have affected the stock market. And so the event study um, <clears throat> is, you know, we do this just to explain very quickly, discrete, discretizing a sample into 10 minute intervals. And as a baseline, we look at the market's value in the 10 minutes prior to an announcement and compare that baseline with its value 20 minutes after the announcement. 
And let me just explain some of these announcements. There are many, many of these announcements and, and many new facilities, so I won't have time to go into all of those. But uh, you know, on March 3rd at 10 a.m. and again on March 15th at 5 p.m., the Federal Reserve released you know, FOMC statements outlining conventional monetary policy steps to address the slowing economy by lowering the target range for the federal funds rate and increasing holdings of Treasury and agency MBS. There were two others that fall into this sort of category that we were, going to, were just going to call conventional monetary policy announcements uh, because they pertain to announcements regarding the conduct of these conventional ways that monetary policy can operate to affect the economy. Now, this table is just looking at those announcements for March and April. And uh, what these stars are indicating, indicative of, is that these announcements had strongly statistically significant effects on the market. And the coefficient values themselves give you the, the size, the magnitude of those effects in percentage terms. But what we see in, those, in the 20 minutes right after the announcement, uh, but we see, what we see is that these coefficients are mostly negative. And the sum of the impact of these announcements on, for example, the S&P 500 is negative 17%. And so with the exception of the March 3rd announcement, all of these are associated with a decline in the market in the minutes immediately subsequent to it. Now, naturally, that doesn't mean that the Fed announcement per se was the root cause of those declines. In the case of the March 15th announcement, the lowering of the target range for the federal funds rate from zero to one quarter percent seems only to have amplified worries over the extent of the damage from the pandemic, according to news reports. And so there are these well-known information effects that uh, researchers such as Nakamura and Steinson have talked about. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, then we go on to a separate series of announcements. Uh, you know, there, the Fed first then stated that it would revive or expand credit facilities that are very similar to those created and used during the 2008 financial crisis. Um, in addition, on March 23rd of 2020, the Fed began uh, the first of several communications on the creation of credit facilities that were entirely new to the COVID-19 crisis. These were designed to extend credit to corporations, to small businesses, to households, to state and local governments. And this went well beyond the, 20, the, the 2008 playbook. There were numerous announcements. We're going to call all of these sort of unconventional monetary policy announcements, but um, just to classify them. And, you know, but there were a lot of these announcements and a lot of facilities were created. I'm not going to have time to, you know, go into the details of all of these. They're in the paper, but let me just mention one. On April 9th at 8 30 in the morning, the Fed announced that it would take additional action to provide up to, quote, 2.3 trillion in loans to support the U.S. economy. Um, and these were going out to all of these different groups um, of players that I just mentioned. And so here we're looking at everything that we've classified as an unconventional monetary policy announcement. And what is immediately clear from examining all these events is that not all announcements of Fed actions to address the economic costs of COVID-19 were associated with a rise in the market. Indeed, among the, those that we've classified as unconventional monetary policy announcements, there are at least four for which there was little to no evidence that they served as the impetus for a market rally. Now, you know, part of what we did here is we closely uh, analyzed, um, you know, vast amounts of news articles to try to understand what else might have been going on. And at least two of those four appear to have been ponderated by bad news about the virus. Others were widely anticipated, according to some news reports. So when you look at them all together, these announcements really have only a small impact on the market, lifting the S&P only about 1.5%, which is what this number here is telling us. However, there were um, five separate unconventional policy announcements in March and April that were found to be associated with a rise in the stock market. And among these, the most important communication quantitatively was that April 9th announcement in which the Fed announced it would take additional steps to provide up to $2.3 trillion in loans to support the economy through its creation of all these new credit facilities. So that's the one that has the biggest impact, right? Um, and uh, you see that here quantitatively. It alone gave a 3% boost to the market. There's also the March 17th and March 20th announcements um, about uh, you know, commercial paper funding and dollar swap lines that seems to have quantitatively played an important role. 
collectively, um, you know, you look at various indices, uh, these five announcements are associated with gains of approximately 8.3% in the S&P 500 and about 12% in the Russell 2000 index. <clears throat> now, with the benefit of hindsight, we can now observe how much credit the Federal Reserve has actually extended or did actually extend under these facilities. And to do that, we refer to the Federal Reserve's periodic reports to Congress that were delivered on August 8th, the first one, um, 2020, and then December 11th, 2020. And these were all about these new credit facilities. And from those reports, we can observe that as of July 31st of 2020, the total value of credit extended under all of these new facilities was just 101 billion. Remember, it was 2.3 trillion the Fed stood ready to provide credit and only 101 billion. Um, and this pie chart tells you which facilities of the 101 billion um, play the, the various roles. Um, these have, you know, the biggest one is this paycheck protection plan loan facility, right? That accounted for about 70 billion. The Main Street Lending Plan uh, um, program, for example, uh, that had only outstanding loans of only 87.6 million, that's million with an M, even though the total value of collateral pledged to secure those loans was 37.6 billion. Now, by November 30th, we know that the total value of these loans had shrunk from 101 billion to 86 billion with the Main Street Lending Program shrinking to 6 million. So, as we all know, the market, of course, only continued to climb over the summer and the fall of last year. Uh, so it's, it's quite clear that these um, credit facilities, uh, you know, the fact that they didn't actually per amount to much lending, um, you know, <laughs> didn't, uh, you know, wasn't, wasn't really, uh, that's not what the Fed announcements were ultimately about to the extent that they did turn around the market. So overall, what do these results suggest? Well, they suggest that the Fed announcements uh, specifically about these new credit facilities did play a direct role in the market turnabout, but perhaps somewhat ironically, it did not do so, they did not do so via a substantive extension of credit to support the economy. And there's little evidence from the high frequency event study that traditional monetary policy steps were the impetus for a market rally. Okay, so let me just conclude here. Um, by reiterating what we were wanting to understand here, we wanted we were looking really at these early months and there was this dramatic volatility in the stock market and we wanted to understand what caused the stock market to fall 34% in, in you know, sort of a month and then recover so rapidly. We used a structural model to bound the role of fundamentals and found that fundamentals such as cash flows, output and profit shares have very limited impact without very implausible shock sizes or persistences. And the decline in short-term interest rates found to play a relatively minimal role, unless you just thought market participants expect it to be much, much more persistent than have been in historical data. And you know, if we think about the market just in the last few weeks, we can see that you know the idea that interest rates would forever remain um, at rock bottom levels is probably not a reasonable assumption. But all of this then points to sharp fluctuations in the pricing of risk, think sentiment or risk aversion, risk tolerance, that kind of thing. We used an event study to estimate the impact of the Federal Reserve and their policy announcements on these uh, sort of risk pricing fluctuations. And we found that conventional policy announcements are associated with large declines, largely through an information effect. Um, and subsequent, uh, a subset of the unconventional policy announcements many of which pertain to these new credit facilities did contribute something to the market's rise, um, about 12%, uh, an increase in 12% of the uh, market's value. So uh, for, the, uh, for the small stocks at about 8% 8, 8 for the S&P 500. However, only a small fraction, about 100 billion of the promised $2.3 trillion um, you know, was ultimately lent on these facilities and then that really reinforced the notion that the Fed helped engineer recovery in the market, mainly by turning around sentiment more than substance. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Um, should I Thank you, Sydney. stop yeah. sharing my slide at this point? or? Yeah, you can stop sharing slides so people can see you. 
Um, so while people are gathering their questions, let me ask you. So um, you made it very clear that it was the change in sentiments uh, broadly defined, and I understand it's very hard to measure, and uh, that the Fed uh, contributed in addition to actual real effects has contributed to the change in sentiments. But do you have a story in your mind of whether it was just the Fed that turned the markets around or whether it was something else happening around that time that could explain why the bottom of the market happened specifically at the time that it did? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to to speculate on stories without, I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to do this event study is because we wanted to put some actual evidence behind anything. There were lots of stories floating around. And if you looked at the you know, press accounts at the time, it was mostly about the Fed um, and then somewhat to do with fiscal policy. So, um, you, know, that, you know, it's easier, uh, somewhat easier to analyze Fed announcements, which are systematized than announcements on fiscal policy, because there's a lot of uncertainty around those before that anything is passed. But that could be one thing else. You know, the, the idea that fiscal policy was was um, going to, it really was unprecedented in magnitude. And, and so that could have um, helped turn things around to some, to some degree. Um, you know, the stock market is interesting because you, as we saw in one of the plots, right, their fundamentals weren't really hurt, if anything. <laughs> Right. The stock market actually did really well out of this pandemic. And that's partly because, you know, I mean, increasingly the market is value is concentrated into the hands of, you know, a few big tech giants and they actually um, inadvertently profiteered just from a pandemic that uh, shut down uh, other ways to spend money. So um, it, it's, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's it's the, the fiscal response probably wasn't in the end that important for the market itself. Um, it played some role, but for these big tech giants, it obviously wasn't. They, they weren't really threatened by if anything, they were helped by this. So, um, but it, it's hard to know in real time how how this is all going to play out, right? So in the beginning, you just see other sectors being hit really hard, and there was some hope that they would they would be given. Um, unprecedented degrees of health, airline industry, and so on, and, and small businesses. Yeah. So I have a few questions in the Q&A. So one is just a clarifying question. Uh, how long after the announcement of the Fed did you measure the impact on the market? 20 minutes. And, and that's a great question because there's no right answer to that question. Um, you know, it, 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 the, the, the effects on the, of the Fed could be even larger if you go out. But of course, the lar farther you go out, the less narrow your windows, the more other events and other pieces of news get in there and sort of muddy the identification. So, um, you know, there's a trade-off and, and you know, this, is, this is a window that other people have used for other kinds of event studies. But, um, you know, our strategy is to try to keep the window fairly narrow so that we could say with confidence, even if it was conservative, that it was the Fed. And then also, but there's a lot of fast moving information going on at the time, simultaneously combing hundreds of news sources to try to understand if, if even in those narrow windows, something else might be, some other piece of news might have been moving the market in a direction that would complicate the analysis. Thank you. So I have a couple more questions here on Kind of thinking uh, more about um, the causes of the decline. And so one question is about uh, what about the risk of greater reaction in output and profits than we actually observe? Uh, does your model account for you know, expectations of potentially greater decline in output and profits? And another question is, was there any evidence of short sellers uh, exacerbating the decline during that time that could explain, you know, add an additional multiplier to that? Um, on the first question, um, so, you know, we, we, we did use surveys to try to get a sense of the size of what was the shock, that is what was unexpected. 
and um, it's possible that other surveys showed bigger magnitudes. Um, but I, I, you know, I think where the uncertainty really would have been, it would have been in how persistent the shock was more than the magnitude. And I guess my, my answer is just that, um, as we've seen that even if you assume that this was a 100% permanent shock and there would be no expectation that, you know, that would just be lost output and then everything from, you know, in the future, we have no expectation that we're gonna mean revert, then um, you still can't, you just can't explain, you, you need something else to explain that, that dramatic uh, drop. Um, short sales, I don't have any good information on that. Um, I think that's an interesting question and you know I just haven't dug into um, sort of aggregated data on short short sales and what role they may have been playing. Okay, thank you. So um, another question is uh, is more a hypothesis that the Fed essentially announced that they were backstopping corporate debt and that's what changed expectations uh, of corporations and made them uh, less risk averse and that changed markets. So is that kind of what the story you are telling? I think it's consistent with it. You know, I mean, what we're basically finding is that the, the announcements did do something to, let's just use the word psychology for lack of a better term, um, because the substance of what was behind the backstop, you know, it's not, <clears throat> if, if the, there was, but I mean, all of that is very consistent with the idea that there was a lot of worry about stuff that perhaps yet happened. And then, you know, the Fed does something or makes some announcement that makes the worry go away um, without anything really happening, right? So um, without a, lo a large, um, you know, with, with, without anything of substance regarding what they actually announced actually happened. So I think with that, I mean, another interpretation that sometimes people have is that maybe the markets affect sort of a, a expect, you know, are, are taking this as, as uh, you know, an expectation of a sort of very persistent Fed put. And I think that would fall into a similar category. So um, a new question here, um, you mentioned that output was falling as a result of lockdowns, but do you think it's possible that people were misattributing long-term issues in production to the pandemic? Um, so, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So um, I just got a horrible echo just now. Uh, let me, it, it's possible that some, you know, some mixing up of what was happening and why it was going on. I think it's important just to emphasize that whatever was happening pre-pandemic, we sort of took that out by looking at the, comparing the survey expectations prior to understanding that this was gonna be incredibly disruptive to the economy. We took that out, right? And so if, if people had sort of had any expectation of, of, of you know, other factors besides the, what was being directly caused by the pandemic that got taken out. And there was just this abrupt change in, uh, in what people expected, um, you know, right, right after the pandemic hit. So it, you know, I think that um, one of the things that is po possibly relevant is that these, um, you know, lockdowns and the, everything that, you know, happened may have some longer term consequences for things like the distribution of output. Um, you know, and that's, our, I think, one of the concerns of the Fed is that this long term scarring in certain sectors of the economy could be harder to come back from. So it's not as if there aren't um, other kind of structural things that get mixed up in this, but, um, you know, sorting out what part of that's caused by the COVID shock and what part of that you know, um, might have been there prior to the COVID shock isn't exactly trivial, but in our approach, we're sort of taking out the expectation prior. And, and, and you know, if that were in the expectation prior, that would have been taken out of the, the large drop, the shock that we, that we calibrated from the survey of professional forecasters. So I have a question. I think it's kind of related to the signal extraction problem. So 
do you think it's possible that just the sheer amount of uncertainty we had about the pandemic itself and its economic impacts and any kind of lockdown measures or fiscal support managers, all of this was a lot of uncertainty at the very beginning, but by late March, some of the policies became more clear and that just, you know, even even though some of the policies continued to have negative impact on profits, just the reduction of that second moment uncertainty uh, could have contributed to the recovery, the market recovery. Right, that it probably contributed something. Um, the reason we don't think uh, it can, you know, I mean, we don't think it can explain all of it though, is because if you look at the, the abruptness of the turnabout, on uh, uh, March 24, and how quickly the market recovered. Uncertainty measures, at least for the broader economy, just had not come down that much. They were still very elevated. They come down a little bit, but it's just nothing really. It, it's really hard to explain um, these rapid movements with uncertainty measures that move. Uh, you know, that are pure uncertainty measures. Now, if you look at the VIX or something, that's sort of that itself has movements in the price of risk. In, right, in the variance pricing risk. So it's not a pure uncertainty uh, measure. And, you know, I mean, um, Ian Martin is, has done some work where he's measuring um, high frequency movements in the stock market risk premium from options data. And from those, you can really see that these appear to be coming from the pricing of risk. And in our, pre in our other paper with Martin Letow, we kind of trace that out. Um, these high frequency fluctuations, big spike in the risk premium, according to his options data estimates in the crisis, financial, the great financial crisis, for example. Um, that's all coming in our model. There's no way to explain that. We, be, we do have some endogenous uncertainty moving around in the, in the other model. That's all coming from the pricing of risk. So, my my gut instinct is that the the just the the part of it that moved so quickly, um, that had to be somewhat the pricing of risk. I do think as we get farther out in time and as uncertainty sort of resolved more and more, that that may have played an additional role in the market price later, right? Sort of in a more low frequency um, sense. So my understanding that the markets around the world, so you're focusing on the US markets, but pretty much the markets around the world really followed very similar pattern, even though the spread of infection and the spread of uh, lockdown measures was not all completely synced across countries. Did you have a chance to look into that and kind of, do you have a story for that? Um, we have not really looked into, I, I guess I can't really answer that question. We haven't looked, um, we haven't exploited any of the potential heterogeneous um, out, out, you know, outcomes across countries. Um, markets are so integrated you know, internationally that one might expect that you know, what's going on specifically in France versus um, Germany versus, um, you know, especially for smaller countries is not quite relevant for the global stock market. But, um, but I do think there are other interesting questions uh, about the pandemic and um, uh, that, that one could think about exploiting these difference, um, differences in the behavior of the markets across, um, across time and looking at different um, you know, po policies on, on lockdowns and you know, uh, those have been very interesting to watch differences from Germany and the US and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so, but we haven't, we haven't looked at that. So I have a couple of questions in the Q&A feed that's kind of looking now at 2021. Um, and one question is, do you have an explanation for the stock market performance in, you know, at the beginning of this year? Uh, and uh, specifically, you know, the Dow Jones has been uh, historically weak in January, and now it's down, and then, and then it's it was it was down, and now it's up again. And um, do you think there is vaccination that's contributed to this? And another question is, uh, do you think you know, with all the discussion in the media about the inflation and the Fed, and you know that the, the 
the most recent market uh, reaction to, to the Fed statements. Do you think the Fed should consider rising stock market as an indicator of inflation? And should they worry about that? Um, okay. Uh, listen, I, so the, the inflation question, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on that because, you know, I do think there's just a tremendous amount of volatility being created by uh, uncertainty over the situation that we now find ourselves in where uh, we haven't really been in with this sort of unprecedented large expansion and their you know supply has been sort of cut back and will it be able to ramp up and and i just think that the um uncertainty around inflation is uh, and what it's going to do is is really high so um whether the Fed should be looking at the markets for that, or I mean, I definitely think they should look at markets. Um, but I, you know, I, I just think that uh, it basically what I think what's going on with the market right now is that it's really trying to understand uh, what all of this means, what this this big package that's coming down the pike means um, when added on to other unprecedented packages. And uh, there's just a lot. There's huge standard error bands. Everyone's guessing. And so the market's going to be volatile on, on those. But, I, you know, I mean, in terms of what's, I do think it's a really interesting and important question as to why um, the market continues going up um, all through the summer and, you know, on through the end of last year. And just, you know, valuations just kept climbing. Um, and, you know, I think one of the reasons you're seeing some volatility and perhaps a little, um, bit of a tail a tailwind down is because they were climbing and valuations were getting quite high. Um, but, you know, I mean, in other work that I've done, we have focused on um, the role of the Federal Reserve, not so much in these high frequency announcements, but in terms of what the market is expecting them to be doing in terms of the stance of their monetary policy. And I think one of the reasons that the market can, you know, just continue to rise uh, rapidly is because it was very loudly telegraphing an intention to remain crouched in an extremely dovish stance for an extended period of time of unknown length. And in this other work that we've done, you know, if you just look at, at trying to uncover a low frequency movement in the federal funds rate and compare that to various measures of the so-called natural rate or of interest, which shouldn't, you know, which moves around for other reasons, not because of the Fed, you see that basically since the year, you know, since 2000, the Fed has been sort of in a very um, dovish, dovish stance, and and it, we call it a dovish regime. And um, over that time, you see valuations have been relatively high, at least especially when you compare to the broader economy and not just the fundamentals of the stock market. So um, the market may be trying to figure out whether the Fed is going to finally come out of this dovish stance at some point in the future. And in our previous research, that would lead to yeah, lower valuations in the lower market um, as, as they try to uh, raise, raise short-term interest rates above this sort of natural rate um, where they've been basically low with the exception of like um, a year and a half since the year 2000. Thank you for this. So, so one follow-up on this, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion of the neutral interest rate R star going down over time, uh, roughly since then. Uh, do you think the markets have a difficult time distinguishing between the decline in R star and the monetary policy stance? Um, um, I'm just going to see if I could show a slide. Um, Maybe, um, I don't know if I have enough time for that, probably not. So it's possible, um, but, uh, you know, uh, you, the market's reaction to the Fed, you know, and the, the work that we've done has suggested that maybe it, 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 it does see a clear distinction there um, because if it's just, um, the natural rate, then it's it's not clear, you know, that that's going to have the same kind of an effect as the Fed trying to do something, you know, um, outside of what 
sort of the equilibrium would lead to naturally. So, um, you know, I, I haven't really, I think we need a model to sort out the roles um, of the natural rate versus the fat around the natural rate um, a little bit more carefully uh, in order to understand if there are big differences in those roles. But um, because in many models, there wouldn't be a huge difference, but in other models, there would. Um, and it really just depends on how you, you model investor behavior and how whether they're using bonds to hedge stocks and those kinds of things. Um, I was going to show you a plot, but I think we're getting close to the end of the uh, time that we have. So I'll just say that it's not difficult to look at and see the regimes. Um, and there, there's widely understood measures of the natural rate. You hear professionals talking about the natural rate all the time as if they know what it is. And it's not difficult to plot that against the actual funds rate and to see uh, where the gaps are. So whether they have a hard time figuring out or not, I'm not entirely sure, but um, um, it would seem that it shouldn't be that difficult to figure out. Okay, well, thank you very much. I don't have any more questions on q and I want to give a last chance to the panelists uh, in case they have questions. Um, short of that, let me thank Sydney for her time today and a very uh, uh, insightful talk. And thank you to all the attendees for being here and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Galena. Take care.